on clearing the clutter inside and out, we're talking about being mentally strong and how that can support you in releasing mental, emotional, and spiritual clutter. Best-selling author Amy Morin shares tips on how to concentrate on the positive to overcome challenges as we continue our month focusing on spring cleaning. Welcome to Clearing the Clutter Inside and Out with Julie Caraccio. Every Tuesday at 1 p.m., hear easy to implement tips on decluttering all areas of your life physical, mental, emotional, spiritual, and energetic. Learn how to release clutter and get organized to create the life you choose, deserve, and desire. An award winning professional organizer and coach, Julie is passionate about supporting people in clearing clutter so they can share their gifts with the world and live a more joyful and fulfilling life. I have a very good friend of mine who is very supportive of my business. And if he sees anything on organizing or clutter, he sends it to me immediately. Well, a few weeks ago, he sent me an article and he said, oh my gosh, you have to read it. You're absolutely going to love this. And I thought, eh, maybe, hmm, okay, you know what? He sent it to me and I'll check it out. He was 100% right. I read this, it was just the article, not the book, and I thought, I've got to contact this author. And luckily, we can find everyone on Google. I Googled her and said, hey, I'd love to have you on the show. Will you come on over? And she said, yes, and I'm very excited. I read a lot of personal development books, and I haven't been this excited about one in a long time. So let's get started. I want to tell you about today's guest. Amy Morn is a licensed clinical social worker and psychotherapist. Since 2002, she has been counseling children, teens, and adults. She also works as an adjunct psychology instructor. She serves as About.com's parenting teens expert and child discipline expert. She's a regular contributor to Forbes and Psychology Today. Her expertise in mental strength has attracted international attention. Her best-selling book, 13 Things Mentally Strong People Don't Do, is being translated into more than 20 languages. A sought-after speaker, Amy loves to share the latest research on resilience and the best strategies for overcoming adversity and building mental muscles. Welcome, Amy. Thanks for having me. Well, let's get started. I'm really excited. Briefly tell us what prompted you to write this article, which you later turned into your book. Well, when I was 23, I started my work as a therapist and thought, okay, life's going to be great. I've got to uh, landed a big job as a therapist and I was married. I bought a house and I thought, okay, I'm on this road to success. What could go wrong? And then the rug was pulled out from under me when my mom was um, suddenly passed away from a brain aneurysm. And I found myself grieving and having to figure out now, how do I go to work as a therapist and help other people with their problems when my own life is in shambles? And that was really when my journey with mental strength started to become personal. And it taught me a lot about the same skills I was teaching to other people, but it just really reinforced to me um, how to be mentally strong. And then on the three year anniversary of when my mom died, my 26 year old husband died suddenly from a heart attack. And again, had to figure out, well, what does mental strength mean? How do I get through my grief as tempting as it was to try to ignore my pain or to um, try to move around it? I knew I had to go through it, but in order to go through it, I had to trust that I had the strength to do it. And, and you know, if you look a few years down the road, life started to get a little bit better. I got remarried, um, moved out of the place that I had lived with my first husband, and Steve and I bought a new house, but um, moved to a new area. And then just as quickly as I thought, okay, I've got this fresh start in life, my father-in-law was diagnosed with terminal cancer. And it was then that I wrote down, sat down and I wrote this list of the 13 things mentally strong people don't do because I needed a reminder of all those bad habits that could hold me back and so it did it started out as an article i published it to the web sort of on a whim thinking maybe it would help somebody else and then it blew up and went viral and i got an opportunity to to write the book thankfully well it's it's wonderful and i just want to say i'm not going through a crisis right now this is just really i believe for everyday living can really support people so mentally strong people do things differently how are they able to not create what I would call clutter to keep them from succeeding? 
Well, one thing is, you know, we only have so much time and so much energy and we can choose how we spend our time and how we focus our energy. And so I think being mentally strong is really about focusing on those things that you can control and saying, okay, I'm going to put my energy where it's going to be most, most worthwhile rather than running around and, and exhausting yourself, doing all sorts of things that just aren't going to be useful to your life. Why do you think people struggle with being able to follow and implement the 13 habits? You know, I think when I wrote my list again, I didn't mean to write a book. It was things that I knew that I did, but I'd seen it in my therapy office too. And it's often the shortcuts that we take to say, I'm going to feel better in the moment by doing this right now. And it does, it can make you feel better temporarily, but in the long run, it really makes your life worse. It creates more problems rather than solutions. And so I think we often just look for those shortcuts or the easy way out and start getting into those bad habits. And then it's hard to break them when you are just so accustomed to doing them. I want to talk, uh, briefly discuss three of your habits. I talk a lot about how your point of power to change is by being in the present moment. I believe when you live in the past or the future, you create mental clutter. Number seven of your strategies is that mentally strong people don't dwell on the past. How can focusing on the past be destructive? You know, whenever we think about the past, for a lot of people it brings up pain or regret or thinking, boy, I should have done things differently or if only. And, and that keeps you stuck because it doesn't let you say, how do I focus on the present? And, and for some people, it's just about remembering the good times, whether they are romanticizing, you know, how great life was back in college or how much better things were when the kids still lived at home or something like that, which also keeps you from saying, well, how do I make today as good as it could be? despite whatever happened. And so the key is to really say, how do I reflect on the past and learn from it, but not stay stuck there. And it's really about making peace with your past so that you can enjoy your present and then make the future as good as it can be. I wonder if social media keeps us stuck. I have a friend from high school and you know, I've been very fortunate. I got married later in life. We're still married. I still personally went but she had a divorce, but I'm like, okay, it's been like five years now. And the hatred and the anger towards her ex-husband and his new wife, it just, you know, it's, she can't get out of it. Yeah, I think that's true for a lot of people that they end up, you know, if you still get all the information about people from that are no longer in your life. And then for a lot of people that just fuels more fire of thinking about it and having access to that little bit of information can keep people stuck. I consider your first suggestion, don't waste time feeling sorry for yourself, as a way to prevent emotional clutter. How can feeling sorry for ourselves, what I would call being a victim, be harmful to our success? Well, you know, I, I try to explain to people that feeling sorry for yourself is different than just being sad or grieving or when bad things happen, you want to be able to experience those emotions. But self-pity really goes beyond that. It's when you start to think, you know, nobody else has these sort of problems or when you exaggerate how bad your life is and, and you start to think you you are suddenly struck with more misfortune than you can handle and that's what keeps you stuck because it keeps you focused on on the problems in life and you can't create a solution until you start looking forward but self-pity really keeps you just stuck you don't want to move you just want to stay right where you are and gather as much sympathy from other people as you can and when you're doing that it's really hard to make your life any better because instead it's like you dig in your heels and just want to prove I shouldn't have to do anything because all these bad things happen to me and you're trying to justify your inactivity. I started this year. Well, first of all, what I loved about your book when I started reading it, this one of the reasons I really enjoy this book is it satisfies both my left and right brain. I think it is formatted really well and really easy to read. And you, at the beginning, I like give people, okay, are you doing this, this and this and provide a list that might help them figure out if I'm doing this habit or not. And I laughed because five years ago, I was like, oh, I probably could have checked up everything on this. And someone said to me once, not too long ago, you know, look at your, this is probably five, six years ago, look at your Facebook posts, they're really negative. And I thought, well, that's not right. But I was able to hear that and went and looked back. And so one thing that I've developed is a daily gratitude practice. And for instance, this year, I decided, I felt really moved to put my Facebook page is public, anyone can follow it to do a daily gratitude. And so, but really heartfelt, you know, the other day I was like, oh gosh, I'm thankful for the heat because it's such a, you in Maine, it's probably not gonna be a, be a beach day for you guys, but really thinking, I do, there's, I mean, and it's not discounting problems, but remembering we have so much to be grateful for. 
that's just it, you know, when you have clean air to breathe and water to drink and even if you only have a couple of dollars in the bank, you're still richer than most people on earth. Sometimes it just goes back to remembering those little things that, boy, we sure are fortunate and it's easy to take those things for granted sometimes. Ready to change your life? Are you ready to release all of your clutter, physical, mental, emotional, and spiritual? Our new Declutter Your Life video series is a how-to, go-at-your-own-pace course to guide you through the process of clearing clutter. Learn more at reawakenyourbrilliance.com. The last principle that I would like to touch on is number 12, which I view as a form of spiritual clutter. You shared that mentally strong people don't feel the world owes them anything. How can believing we are owed something keep us stuck? You know, I think a few different ways. I see sometimes people will say, okay, I have a college degree, so I, therefore I deserve a job. Or I've worked at my company for 10 years, so I deserve a promotion. But when we start thinking that way, it instead of making those things happen, it's like we take a break and just expect it to come to us, and it keeps us stuck sometimes. And, you know, I think another way is, is sometimes for myself, especially when you go through bad things, you think, well, okay, I went through five bad things, so I deserve good things to happen in my life. And I'll have people that will say that to me too, like, oh, that's so good you got to write a book because you deserve that. But the truth is there's no fairness czar out there who hands out and makes sure that we all get a fair hand. Life isn't necessarily fair, but I think when we want it to be fair, then we start to keep score and think that we're owed things. But it's just not helpful because it keeps us from getting out there and making good things happen when you just sit back and wait for it because you think you deserve it. Absolutely. Would you be able to share a concrete example or two of how following these habits have had positive results for your clients? Yeah, you know, I'm in my office as a social worker, when I work with clients, we often talk about, okay, what are your goals and what are the good things that you're going to do and how are you going to get there? Um, but sometimes, you know, people are so busy already, adding more activity to their daily lives just stresses them out even more. So sometimes we just say, well, what are the things that you can subtract from your life? How do you start taking some of your activity away and getting rid of the things that are holding you back? Because you become like this hamster in a wheel and you just don't get anywhere despite your good habits. So to add five more good habits to your week just can be overwhelming. And so I've worked with plenty of people where we'll say, okay, what's one less thing that you can do? And when you subtract that from your life, then what are you going to do instead? How are you going to enjoy that? And so for example, just sometimes it's simple things when people say, I'm going to set aside 10 minutes a day just to write in a journal. They'll say, you know, that transforms my whole day because I can sleep better because all these things aren't running through my head at night anymore when I get them out on paper, when I allow myself to shut off all that social noise and I can sit down and, and be alone with my thoughts because I say mentally strong people don't fear alone time. But when they start to say that's all that it took to change a lot of my other habits in life, then it's really simple and it doesn't take up that much time. So I see a lot of times people, it's just really simple, small changes and taking away the things that aren't helpful and people will say, gosh, made a big difference in my life. Absolutely doable. Would you be willing to lead us in a short exercise from your book that you suggest for people to uh, avoid one of your 13 common habits? Yeah, one of my favorite ones is, um, cause number two on my list is that mentally strong people don't give away their power. And that's one of the most common ones people will talk to me about because they'll say, you know, I, I do. I blame my, my mother-in-law for ruining my Sunday nights when she comes over for dinner. Or somebody else will say, well, I blame my boss for the fact that I hate my job. And so taking back your power is really about saying, I'm in control of how I think, feel, and behave despite whatever's going on around me. And so one of the exercises that um, I talk about in the book is to say, well, where is your time and energy going? And to sometimes to just draw that out and make a pie chart that says, you know, who takes up most of your time and your energy? And are those the people that you want to, to have that much time in your life? Because often what we do when we have a, whether you have an annoying family member or a really mean boss, you spend your extra time complaining about that person or thinking about it or dreading spending time with them. And so suddenly that, you know, one hour meeting with your, neighbor that you maybe didn't want to do turns into four hours of dreading it and then two more hours of complaining about it. And so you think, well, this person just took up 
six or eight hours of my day when really it, I only wanted to give them 30 minutes or whatever it might be. But I think there's plenty of examples of times where we don't set healthy boundaries. And so just acknowledging, okay, from the, I'm an adult. From the time I wake up until the time I go to bed, everything I do is a choice. The people I choose to spend my time with, the places I choose to go, it's all up to me. And just acknowledging that that we can make those choices can make a big difference. And so I tell people to say, you know, just make a chart and figure out who are the people sucking up most of your time and energy and figuring out is that where I want it to go? And if not, what are you going to do about it? And that there's consequences when you set limits. People might not be happy or they might give you some pushback, but but that's okay. You can still do it. And you know, even when people say, well, I have to work late or I have to work all these hours, well, you don't have to. It's a choice. Maybe you won't earn as much money if you don't, or maybe you won't, um, you know, get that promotion if you don't do it. But just recognizing to yourself that it's a choice and I'm doing this because I, because I want to or because there's light at the end of the tunnel makes a big difference versus when you keep saying, I have to do this and I don't have a choice and it's not my fault and I wish I didn't have to, um, can really make that big attitude shift. I love that we do have a choice and I'm very particular about language and the tagline and, the, and I always end every podcast with create the life you choose, deserve and desire. So many times it's not the life we want. I'm being proactive, choose. And that was another thing. I'm glad you brought that up that I absolutely loved about your book because it is a choice. And I think a lot of people are stuck in, in like what you just said, think that they don't have a choice. Right. In your book, you say mental strength isn't about acting tough. It's about feeling empowered to overcome life's challenges. I think that's a really important discuss distinction. Please discuss. Yeah, that was you know one of the questions I get, or people will come talk to me after a speaking engagement and want to know more about you know if my boss is mean, does that mean he's mentally strong? And and there is a big difference between just acting tough and being strong. And some of the distinctions that are there are you know people who act tough. They're really masking their insecurity rather than working on some of their flaws. They're saying, well, I don't have any. I don't, you know, I don't need any to work on anything because I'm perfect just the way I am. And usually deep down they know they're not, but they just are afraid to be vulnerable. And, you know, there's a lot of other things that people will do too when they're acting tough. Another big one is, is that they'll um, try to control other people rather than controlling their own attitude. They put all of their energy into saying, I must control the situation or I must control other people in order to, to, to keep things just the way that they are. Or when people are acting tough, they also tend to mask their emotions. It's like, I can't be sad or I, I can't um, show people that I'm pleased with their behavior because that would be letting my guard down. And so it's really about knowing that to be strong, you have to be aware of your emotions and you have to have a lot of insight and you have to be willing to say, you know, I'm going to work on things. Whereas a tough person might say failure is not an option. You have to succeed at all costs. When you're mentally strong, you might say, well, failure is part of the process. It's OK to fall down and I'll learn from it and I'll move forward. And and I think just making those distinctions that it's okay to make mistakes and to learn from them and to, to be yourself and to know that you're not perfect rather than trying to pretend like you have everything all together all the time. Excellent. I believe when you clear clutter from your life, you experience more joy and happiness. How does increasing our mental strength achieve that as well? And have you seen any additional benefits from practicing the principles you suggest? Yeah, one of the big things about building mental strength is you just become more relaxed knowing that it's okay. No matter what happens in life, you'll be okay. No matter what hand you're dealt and sort of having that peace to know I'm strong enough to deal with whatever life throws my way that I don't always have to be number one or I, my self-worth isn't contingent on my success necessarily, but that I'm an okay person despite whatever. And it's really about being comfortable in your own skin and knowing who you are and knowing what your values are and then being brave enough to live according to those values, even when other people aren't necessarily big fans of it. And so it um, opens a lot of new opportunities and doors to say, okay, this is what I want out of life, and this is how I'm going to work towards getting it. Wonderful. Please give us three takeaways from today's interview that you would like to leave with our listeners and viewers. You know, I think one would be to exchange self-pity for gratitude. Just every day, whether you have a habit of writing down three things you're grateful for or you're going to talk to somebody else to say, hey, look, this is what I have going on in my life that's good, rather than calling somebody up looking for sympathy. And just making that shift can can make a huge difference. You can't be, um, 
you can experience both self-pity and gratitude at the same time. So that's usually the quickest an antidote to it. And then we say, how do I live in the, in the present? How do I get rid of the regret of what happened in the past? How do I make peace with that? And then how do I quit worrying so much about the future and all the things I can't control, but to make a conscious choice to say, I'm going to live in the present moment today. Whatever it is I'm doing right now, I'm going to do and let go of all those other distractions. And then I guess the third one would be to, to work on being mentally strong rather than just simply trying to act tough for the sake of other people, but to do it for yourself, to say, I want to become a, a stronger person for my own sake. And it's about what happens on the inside, not necessarily what other people perceive on the outside. Excellent. Now, how can people purchase your book, find out more information about you and your services? Now, my book's on sale pretty much at every bookstore out there um, and Target and Amazon and all those sorts of places. Um, and you can find out more on my website, which is Amy Morin, M-O-R-I-N, L-C-S-W, is in Licensed Clinical Social Worker .com. Excellent. Thank you so much, Amy. I enjoyed the book. And uh, any future books planned? Because I'm signed up already. Good. I have. I can't make any official announcements yet, but there's a couple of things in the work that works that I'm just so excited about, but um, more to come soon for sure. Excellent. All right. Thank you, Amy. And thank you, everyone. Go out, clear the clutter to create the life you choose, deserve, and desire. Thanks for listening to Clearing the Clutter Inside and Out. Sign up for our newsletter and receive a free copy of our 10 clutter-free living tips. Ready to create the life you choose, deserve, and desire? Learn about Julie's services including coaching, classes, affirmations, aromatherapy, and her unique How to Declutter Your Life course and more at reawakenyourbrilliance.com. Don't forget to subscribe and join us next Tuesday at 1 p.m. Remember, the journey of a thousand miles begins with one step.